welcome to the sixth broadcast in the EVA 25 series. And I am delighted today to welcome again because uh, she's presented at a previous EVA a couple of years ago and held me responsible for making her sing. Was it at EVA or was it at uh, it was EVA? EVA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Lisa came along, and I think you, you maybe you, you were talking about um, resilient and relaxed and resourceful and stuff like that um, at that event, I'm pretty sure. And I seem to remember that you had the whole crowd up moving around in the room too. From, I did. From, yeah. So you, know, yeah. you, were, you, were, you, were, you were bullying them into to doing stuff, although they seemed to be quite willing. Um, so, Lisa, uh, uh, Again, so I've known, I've known of Lisa for three or four years. Um, I also invited her to uh, a PMI Synergy event where I think she controlled and mastered the crowd there and is often to be seen in and around the sort of uh, inspirational leadership circuit. But uh, um, that, that's, uh, that's no detraction. Really good speaker, really interesting. Again, many know that EVA has got own value in the name, but I um, am and has have always been interested in the other stuff. I like the techniques and, and things, but I, I'm really into behaviours and people and culture. And uh, this is this is Lisa's forte. So without further ado, Lisa, welcome. And um, I shall disappear, but I shall come back uh, in about half an hour. I'll be lurking in the background. OK, thank you. Well, let me see, first of all, if I can share my screen. So let's hope this okay. works. Yeah. I'll stick around for that. Great. Yeah, you're good. Is it working? Yes. Great, thank you. So I hope you can all hear me okay. I'm sure you can. If you've never used Teams before, there's a chat facility. If you want to ask questions at any point, um, you can type them in and then we can come back to them at the end. But we've got plenty of time today. So I'm really hoping you've got some questions because what I'm going to do is kind of spend the next 25 minutes bombarding you with information. It's probably one of my biggest weaknesses. I want to make sure whenever I speak that you've actually got something real and tangible that you can take away and apply straight away back into the workplace. But um, the, the, the downside of that, in, and I guess in, in relation to my weaknesses, that means I have to talk really fast to get as much stuff in there as I can. So you make sure that you, you've got something genuine and, and tangible to take away. Um, because of that, that, that means that I am going to cover some stuff at a fairly high level, but we've got some time at the end. If you want to go into deep, further detail on any of it, then please, please fire away. So just, just to go back to what Stu says. So two years ago, EVA 23 was all about being resilient, about being relaxed, resourceful and ready. But my goodness, talk about a title because we could never have predicted what was going to happen this year when along came coronavirus. And then it kind of goes back to throwing, were we resilient? Are we relaxed? Are we resourceful? Are we ready? And I can certainly speak from my own experience when coronavirus first hit um, in the beginning of this year. Um, I was director of transformation of a company called Sintra at that time, and we um, we specialise in software for in the it's kind of in the financial sector. It's in payroll, and we have billions and billions and billions of pounds worth of of people's pay going through our system. And so you can imagine the systems that we use have to be really really tightly data secure for for the obvious reasons. So when all of a sudden we had to get the entire workforce working from home with considering it's not something that we'd ever done before because we were not that kind of business. You can imagine as the director of transformation, I certainly was not relaxed, resourceful, ready. But the one thing I would say that I'd like to think that I was, was resilient. So what we're going to do today is talk about some of the things that make organisations resilient. How can we remake and remodel what we do now and what we've learned? Because actually we're in we're in another stage of the coronavirus, aren't we, in, in relation to how people are managing working from home. There was the panic stage to begin with and nobody knew what they were doing and people are beginning to settle down to this new norm now. So what I'd like to do for the next 20 minutes or so is give you some real tangible tools that you can take away, think about how do they apply to your organisation, but actually how do they apply to you as an individual and how do they apply to your personal lives as well. So if we take a look at our current environment, 
what have we what are we what are we faced with as we know we've got a lot of stuff going on other than just the pandemic we've got the whole stuff to do with brexit we've got stuff going on with our relationships um with the states with 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 the whole stuff going on with trump and biden so we've got a lot of political and economical uncertainty at the, at the moment and and quite often that state of flux that we're in brings new legislation and for some organizations especially when we don't know what's happening with Bre brexit we're waiting for some of this legislation to come out as well so that puts us in quite a difficult position We've got a lot of technological changes. I mean, we've been going through a lot of technological change for a number of years now. The, the pace is happening rapidly. We know that it means that there's a lot more remote teams and we work differently. Globalization means that we're able to get access to, to different parts of trade and different types of talent all over the world. And all of this stuff brings its, its absolute positives and its opportunities, but it really brings challenges as well, especially if we're looking at in in the current um, environment that we're in now with, with coronavirus, everything's changed so rapidly. And then, of course, that brings along with it a lot of social demands and a lot of environmental needs that were completely different last year. A lot of things have changed in the world of work. And then when we then take that down to a much more micro level and look within organisations, we've got an awful lot of internal flux going on as well, caused by some of these external events in our environment. So. We're seeing a lot more mergers and acquisitions. Um, a lot of companies are going under altogether, unfortunately. We've got a lot of movement with leadership across some of our larger organisations and certainly even within our um, in, in the UK government as, as a typical example. But what we're really seeing on the ground, so certainly in, in the, the Shiny Happy People, the organisation I work for now, um, we are supporting organisations to do strategic human resource management. So that's not about the giving HR advice on legislation and policies and procedures and that kind of thing. It's about how do we make the best of the current situation? How do we do things differently? How do we get the best out of our people? How do we manage the resources that we have given this difficult time, this difficult environment that we're in? So we're seeing a lot of budget cuts, an awful lot of redundancies, closures, projects have been postponed, delayed. And then we've got this whole completely new world, world, sorry, way of working for a lot of people in terms of working from home and the, the opportunities and challenges that, that that brings. So we are finding at the moment that organisations need an awful lot of support to rapidly do things differently to carry on the best way they can in terms of um, business as usual. And when it comes to business as usual, we are still wanting cheaper, better, faster. We're looking at outsourcing, we're looking at automization, we're still looking at standardizing and um, processes and things like that the way that we normally do. But how on earth do we do that when we're in this situation that we're in now of, of so much change? So you may have heard of this term VUCA environment before. So the, 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 what, we, what we say is that at this moment in time, there is an awful lot of volatility. So that this is all about the rate of change. We've also got a lot of uncertainty. So we're unclear about the present. We're unclear about, especially when it comes to, to Brexit as well as the We're unclear about what's happening next. There is a lot of complexity. There are a lot of multiple key decision factors, which means whatever you do with one part of your business could actually have a dramatic effect on another part of your business. But because of the, the complexity of coronavirus, of, of Brexit and all of those things going on, then it's making it really, really difficult for us to make sound decisions. It's making it difficult for us to manage risk. It's making it difficult for us to predict and forecast in the way that perhaps we were used to. But of course, on top of all that, we've got an awful lot of ambiguity where there is a lack of clarity about what's going on. And this is, this is a little bit different to uncertainty. This is not necessarily not having the information. It's about the information out there is so ambiguous that we're actually forming different meanings uh, to, to, the, to the, the sparse information that is out there. So when we look at the, the current environment that we're in and we look about how much do we know about the situation, you can see although we are, we're better prepared than we were earlier in this year, there's still a lot of unknowns. And then how well can you predict the outcome of your actions? That is still really, really difficult for us to do. So this whole VUCA environment, which if you're interested, if you, if you weren't aware, actually comes from um, military strategy. That how, what, how do you strategize in a war zone and in military scenarios when you just can't predict what's coming and it's very fast paced. 
Um, it's really interesting that in the business world, we've taken this acronym even before um, we've been using it in the business world for a number of years now, long before um, coronavirus came along. But now that coronavirus is here, actually, it's a really good framework to begin to think about your current environment and what is it you need to do to manage it and to build resilient workforces, to have business as usual. And to be quite honest, take advantage of some of the opportunities that it presents. So back to the people, though, we are we are human beings and we're in this volatile, complex, uncertain, ambiguous ambiguous landscape. But we're humans, how do we deal with that? And we are not robots, so we tend to deal with it emotionally. And you will find that some people have a fear of change. Some people um, like fast change. Some people don't like um, or like slow change. And you can see here, this is a very simple diagram that kind of says, if we generalize across the population, you will see that for some people, um, unless some people have got a high fear of change and actually they get they really struggle when the rate of change is fast as it is right now. And you can see in that top corner, we've got an awful lot of stressed employees out there. And as we know, stressed employees don't necessarily make the best employees. We don't necessarily make the best decisions when we're stressed. We don't look after ourselves when we're stressed. And then we've got the other side of people that actually these kind of situations bring out the best of them. So how many people have we got in our organisations and our management structures that maybe we don't realise that to move them into a different, into the, to put them into a role that actually they're having to deal with this stuff brings out the best in them. And then, of course, we've got people that um, are in between all of that. This is this is a very general model. But. We need to make sure within our workforces, within our management teams, we understand and we don't put additional pressure on those who just naturally struggle with a fear of change and the pace of change. And we need to find those who actually love it and thrive in it and do their best in those scenarios. But like I said before, this is all about emotions. This is all about how we feel. And you may have seen this before. This is um, John Fisher's process of transition curve. Um, it links very much to the Kubler-Ross curve around um, how people feel when they manage, uh, when they feel with change. And you'll see on here that whilst this is a curve, you can probably all relate at some point to somewhere on this curve since this um, whole pandemic started and the way that we have to work in our organisations is changing so rapidly in this VUCA environment. So we go through different stages and not everybody goes through every stage, not everybody goes through it in, in this order, for example. But we've just looked at how some people actually are so used to being in their comfort zone that when anything happens that puts them outside of their comfort zone, and we've got all this VUCA stuff going on as well. These are kind of, these are some of the kind of feelings and behaviours that you will see in yourselves, in your family members, in your management teams and in your employees. And it's really important that we have to understand this and acknowledge it if we want to move through it and make sure that we do our best for our organisations. So how do we navigate and build resilience in this VUCA environment. So this is the bit where I'm going to go probably quite fast paced to give you as many things and takeaways as, as, I, as I can that you can tangibly apply. I think before we do that, we have to acknowledge and there is any amount of research out there that says some of our best performing organisations have high employee engagement. And it's really easy to spot your, your engaged employees, the high performers, they're innovative, they're efficient, they're committed, they understand the role, they bring a lot of energy. Then we've got the not engaged, minimal effort, little passion, lack of creativity, increased absence, little motivation, a bit checked out when they're at work. And then we've got a small proportion of people that we call the actively disengaged. And these are the people that are disruptive, they're very miserable, they appear to have a bad attitude, they're often late or absent, they waste time and they constantly undermine their co-workers. But if we just pause for a moment and just think back to the last couple of slides that I've just shown you, what we need to do as, employee, as employers is recognise that actually these behaviours, these attitudes, these mindsets that we see are actually symptoms. They're symptomatic of what's going on internally for that person. So 
If you have anybody that appears to be actively disengaged, for example, rather than um, judge that person or get annoyed at that person, look at it as if they're clues, they're symptoms, something is not right for that individual, that the only way they know how to behave whilst feeling whatever it is they're feeling internally is to behave and act out in that way, then what does that tell us? What can we learn from that? What, how does that influence the kind of questions that we need to ask? If we find we've got whole departments, large sections of our organisation that you would describe as not engaged or perhaps actively disengaged or even better engaged, what questions do we need to ask? What is it? What is it that's working? What is it that's not working? What do we need to do? How do we, how much change are we um, important on them on a daily basis and it might be that we can't do anything about that but then there are things that we can do about it that can shift our actively disengaged and are not engaged into engaged and that's what we're going to kind of come on to next but we, if we also look at this in the world of change projects so whether this is right the way up at, at program manager level project manager level or just anything anything within an organization that is some form of change is happening, especially on a larger scale. All of the, the statistics out there, once again, very much like engaged employees, all of the statistics say the more you involve, the more you engage your stakeholders, your employees within that process, the greater success you have on your change project. So what we're looking for on these circles on the bottom here is you're looking for the percentage of purple and blue, the extremely successful you can see actually have much much higher higher um, levels of entirely engaged and um, contribute that they're able to contribute entirely they contribute an, on a very um, spectrum and you can see the impact that that has on our change projects so this is telling us a number of things this is telling us we need to understand what's going on for our employees we need to put those things right we need to involve them in the process involve them in the projects that are likely to cause the biggest amount of stress on some of our employees and we've got much more of a chance of those those change projects being successful. So let's start before we get into some of the tools of what we can do about it, let's start by looking at what we know already. So you recognize this kind of as a typical SWOT. <laughs> the SWOT, believe it or not, is a very underutilized model that is so helpful to shape thinking. So, yes, it's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, but a lot of the time I change those words to these ones. What are the benefits? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What are the development areas? You can apply this to individuals, teams, organisations. But for the purpose of today, we're going to look at it from the perspective of what is all the research telling us so far of the impact the coronavirus has had on the world of work, in particular, in relation to the fact that we've got so many people working from home that we didn't have before. So one, one of the things we absolutely know, there is lots and lots of research, albeit fairly short research, given the, the time scale that, that, that we're in of 2020. But this research is showing that we are, our employees are reporting better work-life balance. They, we are seeing masses and masses of drastic reduction in sickness and attrition. So um, people leaving their, their roles. We've actually got lots of statistics that show that our employees are happier. They're happier because they're able to create that work-life balance in a, in a way that suits them, in a way that they've never done before. Now, when you get happier employees, you get higher productivity. And one of the things that we know, I, I, think, I think came out just this month at the, in the Harvard Business Review, actually, that you can get some, some organizations are reporting up to 22% more productivity from their employees since they've shifted to working from home. And then of course, as we've just discussed, what we get as a result of all of those things is much more engaged in, uh, employees that are engaged in their work. So we've got a whole kind of, if, if you look at it from it, lots of things are happening that all contribute to higher productivity. So that's good. However, there are, there are, there are more opportunities that we're not necessarily leveraging in a way that we could. So, one of the one of the things that the working from home culture brings is the the you don't necessarily need to be in the office and um, because you're working from home obviously but one of the opportunities that that brings is it opens up the talent pool in a much wider way in a more geographical way so if you can make this working from home culture work for you 
What else can you do? How else can we increase those benefits to get even more happier um, employees, even more engaged employees, even more productive employees? How can we get the best talent to come and work for us because we've adopted these new ways of working? It opens up a completely different talent pool. And of course, on society, what we've also got is the massive impact on the environment. There is a huge, massive change in, in lots of organisations' carbon footprints just since they've switched their employees to working from home. So society, there are some huge opportunities we could leverage further. Back to the organisation, though, what we're also seeing is a potential in it for a massive reduction in operating costs. You don't necessarily need the real estate anymore if you embrace this working from home culture. And it's an if, because you've got to work out strategically what's right for your organisation. Now, of course, what does come with all of this are some major challenges. And, and I, I touched upon one of the ones that, that I've, I've personally experienced. The whole, the whole world of data security and regulation doesn't mean that it can't be overcome, but it does have to be very, very seriously considered before you make any decisions about how you would and move your workforce to increase working from home. There is also a lot of research that says for some individuals, actually the level of isolation, especially if they live alone, um, if they've got quite a small social network anyway, they don't have necessarily great support. A lot of people um, are reporting that there is a decline in their mental well-being and emotional well-being because of isolation. So that is a really real concern that we would need to address. And also for some individuals, there is a real challenge to overcome in terms of boundaries. And I mean that in relation of boundaries of time and space, because some people are really struggling to switch off when they're working from home. The, the boundary of world and work, at home and um, work, is so blurred that, that they don't feel like they're at home. When they're at home, they can't switch off. That is a challenge for some individuals. Some individuals can do that really well. Some will struggle. And then, of course, the spatial environment. Have they got an environment? Have they got the space where they can physically work comfortably, safe, safely, and in a way that's productive? So they're challenges. They're, you could look at them as the threats. They are threats, but they can be overcome. Now, there's also a huge list of research of things that have come out of the research that are also challenges, but I've put them not in the challenge box. I've actually put them in the development box because some organisations are dealing with these things really, really well. So rather than it being a weakness, for an, in a, an organisation, if we think of it as some development areas that we can work on and to make sure that we're making the most of the benefits and making the most of the opportunities. So one of the biggest challenges that um, certain managers, I think, faced um, when this, this whole working from home thing first started was trust. How do I know my employees are working? How do I know they're doing the job? How do I know when they're working, when they should be working? And I'm going to talk about trust in a little bit more detail shortly, but actually the trust, the trust question is a really interesting one because it actually can sometimes say more about the manager than it does about the employee. Are you, do, do some of your managers struggle to give up control? Do they manage from um, an authoritarian perspective where they feel like they need to keep an eye and make sure people are doing what they're doing? Because regardless of what's happening in, with, with the whole pandemic, in terms of leadership, what we do know is that you're not necessarily going to get the best out of your people if that's your leadership style. So there's definitely something there to be said about trust. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we can overcome that shortly. But also fixed routines. One of the things um, in terms of building organisational resilience, which I'll talk about again shortly, is one of the areas if we are so used to doing things the way we do them. We have our fixed bureaucratic sometimes, our red tape, our policies, our procedures. And a lot of people, especially those who don't like change, really struggle to move outside of those fixed routines. So that is a development area that, that will need to be worked on for some organisations. One of the biggest things that's been reported um, in, in the research that's done to date um, with regards to working from home this year is problems with communication. Now, they are not insurmountable. Some organisations, Microsoft is, is an example, who have said that they are having much better communication Meetings very rarely last more than 30 minutes because they're using other tools at their disposable to really manage time and prioritize time really well so that it's only the important, so communication's been done so well that all the, the various online meetings, which have started off having meetings for the sake of having meetings when it first started, 
they've really decreased and the communication is actually really on point. So it definitely needs looking at. Knowledge sharing. Now this came out in the research, it's a really interesting one, that one of the things working from home, one of the challenges it poses is how do we share knowledge? When actually what I would say is what all that's done is brought it to the forefront because what we find in organisations that when it comes to knowledge sharing, most of the knowledge is in our employees' heads anyway. And we have real issues when I work with organisations, for example, looking at the talent management strategy and, and um, the succession plans. They have real issues with if a certain person in a certain role leaves, they will really struggle because they've worked here for years and they've got all the knowledge. So knowledge sharing is an issue for our organisations and coronavirus certainly has brought that um, to, the, to the forefront. We've got some challenges around socialisation, making sure that camaraderie is still there. Those inf informal water cooler mo moments, as they've been called, where people share information and share ideas, those kind of informal and um, randomised meetings in the workplace, they can still happen. You've just got to be creative when you're working from home, but it is something that you still need to bear in mind. Once again, same for mentoring, it can still be done. And there is, there is definitely some um, reported statistics coming out that's saying performance management is much more of a, is a challenge, but like I say, I put it in the development area because a lot of our performance management systems rely you on it, how you performance manage someone sometimes relies on how you see them do their job. But once again, really to do performance management really well, we don't often actually use the best um, tools, sometimes we make judgments on performance based on the wrong things and once again a bit like knowledge sharing I think that's bringing this much more to the to the forefront. What are we really measuring? Why are we measuring it? How, how reliable are those measurement tools? And it's really bringing to the forefront a whole different conversation about performance management. So if we're looking about performance, which let's face it, what is, what is, why are we talking about this? It's because we, we run businesses and we want our businesses to be successful and we want to still have high performance during these booker um, times. So in order to do that, we have to understand, well, what is performance? So Box Olatal, they state that performance is ability plus motivation plus opportunity. So if we're thinking about that, what, how we ensure our employees perform at their best, it's a really interesting thought, it's a really interesting concept to think about. Now, interestingly, Pink, he actually states, if we take the ability and the opportunity offer section second and look at just the motivation bit, Pink states that motivation is autonomy, mastery and purpose. Now, if we put all that together, so I use this, um, I think the slides, Steve, are going out afterwards as far as I know it. This is one of the, the tools that I use with organisations when we, we start to think about building talent management strategies. And we put all of that academic research together and what we know is that to get your employees loving their job and be really engaged, they have to have the right ability to do the job, the right skills, the knowledge, the talents, the tools and the environment for the role. They have to know what they're doing, why they're doing it. They need to know um, what their purpose is, what is important to them and why and what's expected of them. And they need to feel part of a shared purpose. They need to have the autonomy, they need to be trusted to do their work and the need to be encouraged to self-track their own performance as well. In terms of opportunity, they need to have the opportunity to perform their role. Too many organisations I go into, people say, well, I'm, I've been brought in to do this, but you can't do anything because the CEO never lets, never lets me do that. He always does this. Or you'd be surprised how prevalent that is across organisations. And there's some fantastic research, I'm going to touch upon it shortly, by Gallup, that actually says in order to get the best out of your employees, you need to make sure they get the opportunities to use their strengths every day. And the strengths, basically, is, is, is kind of their talents. Their talents is what are they really good at and what are they passionate about. So that tends to be a strength. You can be really good at something, but if you don't really care about it, it's, you, you, you get the idea you don't necessarily work at your best. So your strength is something you're really good at and really passionate about as well. Um, so they need to have fantastic teamwork. They need to have opportunities for growth and really interestingly, mastery. We take this one for granted so often is understanding what actually is good performance. What does good performance look like? Ensuring they get the recognition they need the focus on their strengths, and then the opportunity, as we've just talked about, to grow, to master their, their craft, their trade, their skills, whatever it is in their job.
But looking at this from a, a whole pandemic perspective, straight away, the environment in which they're working in, the tools in, 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 as well, they've changed. Their purpose sometimes, with the, 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 some people's roles are so fixed in, in relation to being in an office that it's made people rethink about, well, what's their purpose? And if I'm not here doing those team meetings and if I'm not in the office, what does that mean? I've already mentioned we've got this huge issue about being trusted because they're not in the office. And we know from statistics that organisations struggle with teamwork, they struggle with growth, and they struggle with performance management and being able to recognise people what we, we, the work that people are doing. So we know we've got these key stresses that are happening right now on the model that we know, and a tried and tested model that works in making sure you get the best out of your people. So there are stresses here that we have to be able to deal with. So there are some two fundamental keys to success to making this stuff work. The first one is actually emotional intelligence. So I'm sure you, you probably all know what emotional intelligence is anyway, um, but this is the ability to, um, the emotions, how they drive and impact on um, our behavior, how they impact on ourselves, our ability. Well, actually, I'm, I don't know why I'm talking about this, because I'm going to show you a slide about emotional intelligence. And then, so I'll cover what that is in a second. But it's actually, most interestingly, it's the top predictor of an employee's success is emotional intelligence. Gallup have done lots and lots of research that shows time and time again that the 90, the top 90%, sorry, the 90% of top performers are also high in emotional intelligence. And interestingly, on the flip side, just 20% of your bottom performers are high in emotional intelligence. So we know in relation to performance, emotional intelligence is key. So like I said, if you, I'm sure you all know what this is, what emotional intelligence is already, but there's a personal competence section. This is all about self-awareness and self-management. And then there's a social, comp uh, social competence um, part of the, of the model as well, which is about social awareness and relationship management. So you can, you, this slide will be made available to you, but you can see what's really important here is that you're able to recognize um, traits in yourself and others and regulate them as well. So it's really important. What we're saying is that the top, the 90% of top performers are high in emotional intelligence. So looking at all of these things on here, we will talk a little bit in a little bit more detail in a moment. What is it that we need to do then to build more inter emotional intelligence into our organizations? And that is actually key to success number two, because it's our managers. And what's really interesting about this is that perhaps your managers are the most important factor in your company's success. Because what we know is that the relationship that employees have with a line manager has the most influence over their performance, retention, stress level, and growth. So what we know is that the impact on performance is directly linked to a manager's self-awareness, self-management, self-motivation, social awareness, relationship management skills, or in other words, their emotional intelligence. Now, we've just discussed before that we've got some stresses in the system in terms of how we get the best out of our people given the current way of we're working. So this, your managers, are actually perhaps the most important people in your organization that's going to help your employees get through uh, get through this situation. Now, one of the things that we do know that's coming out of the, the early stage research is that it's putting a lot of pressure on our managers because they're having to be in touch with their employees an awful lot more than they were before because they're not in the office. But actually, what we're saying is those that do that and they put that extra time in, the results are fantastic. That's where we're seeing an increase in productivity. So we also have to bear in mind that we need to really take care of our managers to support them to do this without them burning out, without overload. So they do need additional support. So how do we help managers to lead? So the good news is emotional intelligence and management. A lot of people think, and, and resilience, I'm going to talk about resilience shortly as well. Then yes, people have these things naturally, but they're also, they can be learned and they can be improved. And what we also know from the Gallup research, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, is that what we call the we experiences and the me experiences, that's what we need to um, thrive at work. And the, what that basically means is that I'm recognized as an individual and I'm recognized for my own value. I'm able to use my strengths for me, but I am also 
part of a team. And those two things are separate, but they're both equally important. So this local individual experience entwined with the local collective experience is a key determinant of performance. And it's also really critical when it comes to employee engagement. So the best managers actually have the ability to meet both these two categories of needs for the people on their teams, and they can do it really well. So another interesting thing is that the most important experience at work is the experience of team. So bearing in mind the stresses that we've just talked about, how do we create teams in this virtual world? How do we make sure that that team camaraderie, that team spirit, that communication is still working and thriving in the way that it needs to because we know that's how we get the best performance. So think about this, the, perhaps the biggest decision a company makes is who they appoint as managers. And if we put that into the context of now, remember what I said before, that some people really thrive in these fast paced, fast changing um, environments. So who have you got in your teams that perhaps you're underutilizing? What managers are looking at your managers and looking at your performance of your teams, your department, there will be a direct correlation between your manager, the performance and that manager's emotional intelligence. So that's already something really interesting we can start looking at and exploring to ensure that we're taking advantage of the opportunities that this new world of work is presenting us. Now, I mentioned before these we experiences and these me experiences, and what's really interesting, through the work of Gallup and a company called ADP, they created these eight questions. The um, odd numbers are the me experiences, the even numbers are the we experiences, and what it actually showed was that um, you can just very simply question your employees based on these statements and get a really good baseline of where they are. Now, I have just noticed the time, so I'm going to have to, I'm just going to go, Steve, are you there? Do you want me to start wrapping up? Five more minutes. Okie doke, thank you. So, all of this information is going to be put on the slides afterwards. Interestingly, that question number four, I have the strength and the chance to use my strengths every day at work, is really interesting because that's one of the key indicators of performance of uh, your teams. So, we talked a little bit about resilience. Now, if we look at how do we make our organisations resilient, how do we make our teams resilient in these times, there are some key components. Now, if you look at those components, keeping things in context and perspective, being self-aware, being change optimistic, being optimistic, change positive, having good problem solving skills, taking action and learning from feedback, nurturing yourself, having good social connections, they all need emotional intelligence. You can't do this if actually you're unable to build relationships with people, if you're unable to be, if you're not self-aware and uh, enough to know how the impact of you as a manager is impacting on your employees. So we need to be able to ensure our managers have the skills to be and the, and the resources they need to manage this situation through these difficult times. So we talked about VUCA before and what you're going to see me now is I'm going to go past really fast, loads of slides. They'll all be there for you to have a look at them. So what we know in terms of volatility, we need vision. We need to be reliable. We need to have that shared vision and sense making that leads to agility. We need our managers to do that. For uncertainty, we need our managers to be understanding. They need to be able to build really great relationships. So it means that they need to have high emotional intelligence. In terms of complexity, what we need is clarity. We need to be clear. We need communication is much more important than ever. But a very quick word of warning, dangers of email. We lose so much of the meaning of email. I mean, the, the meaning when we're having a conversation with someone, when those words are written down, because the majority of the meaning that we take from um, a, a particular message is actually 93% of it isn't in the words we're spoken. So be very careful with emails. In terms of ambiguity, it's really important. We need to have agility. We need to be trustworthy. And in order to be trustworthy, we have to be credible, reliable. And in terms of intimacy, show empathy, show discretion. Once again, that comes back to emotional intelligence. And we have to be, make our employees know that our motives are about, they're not all, our attention and our motive isn't all about us, it's about them. 
I'm going to leave this in the slides for later. I'm not going to go through it now. But in terms of what I mentioned to you before, that people really struggle with routines, there's some great, um, this came out in Harbour Business Review just this month, actually, some great example of a tool there that you can help in terms of if your resources are scarce, things are moving fast, the train's unpredictable, how you can move from scripted work processes and routines to improvisation and how that really builds organisational resilience. And lastly, what we then end up with is a much, from this volatile um, environment, we've got something much more calm where we're managing through our managers, through emotional intelligence, through doing all, taking really great opportunities that's presented, leveraging them and actually changing the way we work forever because there are some massive, massive gains that can be, get, that we can gain from, to, from changing the way we work in terms of moving into a more working from home environment. So I've went on and on and on. I did warn you, I'm really bad at that. That just leaves me to say thank you so very much and open up um, if there is any questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, I, I think that this is a huge subject to tackle in half an hour. So I sense that there may be some, some, some follow up uh, discussion that can be organized around this. In the interim, if anybody does have any questions, please put your hand up. Oh, I hope I haven't bored you all to death. Uh, Richard Paljinski, make yourself known. Put your camera on. Let's all, let's all see you. I oh, am they... here, but the room is very dark. Hello. <laughs> I haven't yet turned the lights on. Um, Great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I can't remember the exact words you used, but at one point in the presentation, you were talking about um, people's experience of, of working from home and being trusted um, by their employers. Um, I guess it's been really interesting for for us because, you know, I work um, I work in a client environment and you know, we've often talked way before COVID about, oh, you know, can people work from home on Friday or can people work from home on a Monday, flexible working? And the attitude was no, because we don't know that they'll get anything done. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, everyone's working from home and there's been a mass realisation that it's fine. So I guess what I'm saying is um, if our client environment, which is massive, is trusting all of its people, and certainly I can speak for Arcadis, which has had a lot of success with working from home and, and trusting people to get on with it. Are you seeing the other side of that? Are there other organisations out there that still don't trust their people? Was that the yeah. point that you were making? And if so, how, how bad is it? Because I think I have a blinkered perspective on it because I kind of think that everyone's managed to transition to working from home quite well. Well, but, what, what's interesting is, and I love the saying, is that necessity is the mother of all invention. Because all of the organisations that have resisted it in the past, they've had to do it. There was just no choice. We've had to do it. What we're seeing is um, the work, what what is is being called in academia the worst of both both worlds. Because what we're seeing is people are returning to work, and they're trying to do not the best of each. They're having a bit of both, a bit of working from home, and a bit of working in the office and what for some organizations that's fine but for some organizations what's actually happening is that um, those people who are choosing to stay at home are actually being left out of the conversations that are at work so then we're not necessarily doing all of it when everybody's at home all of the ways in which we communicate when we've got a hybrid where we've got some people at home and some people working from the office there is some, some evidence that's coming out that those people at work are being judged for choosing to stay at home. There is some evidence that suggests that actually they're being left out of the conversations that are happening at work. And there are some organisations who are trying to pressurise people for coming back into the office because they've still got this fear of can we trust our people. So I think it's too early to tell right now because some organisations are seeing the massive benefits and are now working with organisations like myself to look at how can we make this the, the norm going forward. Some are trying to do a hybrid model, it's working for some, it's not working for others, and some are just resisting it point blank and trying to get people back into the office where they can. So I think we need more time 
I think we need more time and more data, but it's probably been coined the world's largest working from home experiment ever. And I think that's probably that that's probably very, very true. And it's but it will in the world that I work in in organizational development, it's going to provide some really, really interesting data that backs up a lot of people's belief that actually there is a lot of gains from trusting your employees and letting them work from home. Thank you. I mean, I guess from, you know, I, I work in the rail industry and, you know, I think one of the fears that is percolating through through our business at the moment, and I have, you know, a lot of conversations with the DFT about this is, you know, if this social experiment and working from home really is as successful long term as people think, you know, there's a real risk that that fundamentally changes some of the national infrastructure business cases on, on what we build. Absolutely. Uh, so there's a lot of concern about that, especially when you're working on a program like I'm working on, where you're literally trying to get the funding for your program right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rail is, is falling through the floor. Mm. You know, who, who would build a new railway right now? Question mm. mark. <laughs> yeah, we go. yeah. OK, thank you, Richard. Uh, Mr Arnold, I think we'll take one from you and then we'll have to move it on. OK, um, you mentioned, Lisa, that um, we would be surprised um, with the performance of some CEOs, um, maybe with their ability to, um, to put the right messages and uh, do their work properly. Doesn't surprise me in the slightest. And of course, the last 30 years, I'd say, and I've worked with hundreds of directors, more than half, I would say, are not really up to it. And it just strikes me that with all the great body of knowledge that you've got and great insight and understanding, um, you said that the most important people and therefore probably the people that you would work with, with the most are the managers. Mm -hmm. Don't you think all of that knowledge and insight should be applied to the directors? Because yeah, I mean, it has to come from, it has to stop at the very start, at the very top. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But it's difficult, though, isn't it? Because they're not necessarily wanting to be critical of themselves. No. Plenty of examples in industry, but there's two big ones at the moment in government. Downing Street doesn't seem to be very clever at management, and neither does the White House. Yeah. And, it, and it's not just personality and attitude. They've all got plenty of that, but they're not competent, are they? I think it, it's surprising. Um, I, I was probably being polite in some respects because a lot of the organisations that I go in, sometimes I'm brought to work in at board level with the CEOs or with whatever shareholders, stakeholders, whatever. Sometimes I'm just brought in with any of the management tiers and you can always, it is predictable. So sometimes if I'm just brought in at a lower management level tier to work with that level of managers, from working with that team without meeting the um the the higher management team i can predict exactly what they're like because it it literally cascades down it really does that must be very frustrating for you then because you're commissioned presumably by the directors to work with the managers yeah i'm very i'm very clear with the organizations that i work with i have a, I have a I'm, I'm very clear that there are certain um and that the environment has to be right i often talk about it like me coming in and doing training and consultancy it's just like planting a seed but if that fertile if that soil isn't fertile if the organization if the leadership team doesn't have an environment that's a bit like a fertile soil those seeds will never grow and they'll waste their investment but so many organizations pay a fortune for training as an example and then there is there's no return on investment doesn't matter how good the training is if those seeds could be the best seeds in the world but if that soil isn't nutrient rich and watered and all the rest of it for those seeds to take hold you will not get the growth you'll not get your return on your investment some people still pay <laughs> um and some people really take that on board and then they think about how they do things differently so thank you yeah thanks bob um uh, just just uh, uh, Lisa, if I may, I'll uh, be very interested to see the impact on this uh, increase in, in efficient and uh, effective working effort once the, in inverted commas, threat has reduced a bit so that there's a, an effective vaccine regime and an effective test and trace regime and things have returned back to, again, in inverted commas, normal working. Um, there's nothing like fear of losing your job to to, to make you work harder. Mm. Uh, it may not make you work smarter or better, 
but I think that uh, an awful lot of the extra effort is possibly driven by uh, the knowledge that they don't want to be in the next tranche of redundancies or furloughs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that that, that, that isn't, uh, um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but I'll be interested to see whether that percentage of extra effort subsides almost because the, the heat's off. But yeah. it, 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 yeah. What's interesting is there's some evidence, but it's only very anecdotal, is that when we remove what we call psychological safety, so the fear of losing your job, those kind of things, that actually has such a detrimental um, impact on your emotional well-being that it quite often has a negative impact on productivity and performance. So, but you're absolutely right. That's yeah. we, we know that as a fact from it anyway. But the in, in putting that into the context of now that there is we, that's very anecdotal at the moment. But yeah. that's certainly what they're <clears throat> suggesting. So again, another thought, and maybe for, for people like yourselves in particular, and for many who are in positions of of, of influence um, in in the meeting. It seems to be that now we shouldn't wait for it all to be over uh, because you, you've touched on the fact that company culture, organisational culture, um, has been driven and been forced to accept uh, working from home, virtual working, and find solutions for it. What you need to do now is to accept that that change does have benefits and really incorporate that into the governance and, and therefore the culture of whichever these organisations are so that when the resumption happens, the change has actually occurred uh, uh, and it's in position. Yeah. The worst thing we can do is not for them, as, as Bob said also, that for the directors to think, well, thank God that's over, let's get back to where we were with the hierarchy. What's really interesting is some of your big organisations like the likes of Facebook and Twitter, they've had such an impact that they've decided, they've already made the decision, that's going to be the way forward. A lot of yeah. big, big companies, <clears throat> especially with large employees, They've, they've taken that decision and they're rolling with it. Yeah, I, well, again, it should be also a great day for the Agile community, I would think, uh, with uh, some of the practices that they're going there. Not to say that we can't do that within the controls community too, by through 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 lean practices and, and just being as smart and clever and efficient and effective as, as, as we've always been. But uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's a very interesting moment. So... <clears throat> uh, I'm afraid we will have to draw this to a conclusion at the moment. Um, we will... Uh, um, distribute your material to the attendant multitude, but I do think a few months down the line we should maybe come back and, and revisit how things have, uh, have changed and maybe a panel discussion talking about um, possibly the changes, the transformations that they've have undergone within the various organisations that attend this uh, could be described as well and we'll see how how, how the landscape has, has, has modified itself. So um, now it's uh, our uh, the turn of our poet, Paul, if he's still around. Um, hopefully he will have smithed a few words. Are you there, Paul? Yes, yeah, Steve, I'm, I'm still going? here. Um, despite Lisa's um, strongest attempts to uh, talk, talk me out of this one. Sorry, no, sorry. Lisa, it was great, Lisa, it was great. I really liked it. And Lisa, I mean, if the economy and, and things keep you know, going the way they are and there's even no room for, for manoeuvre, um, you know, in, in your specialised field. Seriously, consider being a bingo caller. You'd be amazing. Okay. What's my first job? Who are you? <laughs> when I was That's 16. Future. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a poem for you here. A poem for you here, which is called, um, I'm struggling for a title, so I've just spelled emotional with three letters for each one, so it's emotional intelligence. Here we go. The budgets are cutting, the businesses are shutting, the government three amigo updates are off-putting. How do we stay resilient, relaxed, resourceful and ready in an economy that's falling like confetti? Rapidly rejigging, redefining how we make a living, strategic human resources management. Doesn't sound it, but it's actually all dancing and singing getting the best out of the people in who you invest. Because we are living in a VUCA world, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, with everyone worried about being thrown under the bus. Fast change, slow change, the entire scenario rearranged, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threat, keeping cool, no sweat. 
stressed employees need to be happy employees. Working from home, opening up the talent pool, bringing the crown to the jewel, being creative, maintaining the camaraderie. Your employees are the numbers that win the lottery. Part of a shared purpose, not a circus. Trusted opportunity, lead, give them some cred. Allow the individuals to let loose their talent. Fantastic teamwork, recognition makes it apparent. So what if there's no more office? Higher emotional intelligence can be built into the new norm. We don't want sheep, we want Sean. Line <laughs> management are the bridge. Having to be ever ready like the light that always goes on in the bridge. Building higher understanding, communication, credibility, discretion. It's all about a never-ending first impression. That was excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well done, Paul. <clears throat> Lisa. That was a long one. <laughs> I think that was the theme for tonight. I am sorry. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, Paul. Thanks again, Lisa. Um, just a, 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 a brief ad for next week's session. Um, Jonathan Crone of, of, of T5 uh, fame, and I think he also worked on HS2 and, and, and Pharma, uh, so a, a heavyweight project controls professional will be leading a discussion. And the theme is uh, what's called the Project Controls Paradox. The paradox for animated discussion, I believe, is Project Controls. Is it an expensive overhead? And Jonathan will speak to that subject. Or is it an essential enabler? Uh, and maybe our discussion will, will, will move from that fairly anti-view into some solutions so that we can make our case or ensure that we're better making our case. So um, a great deal more sort of user interactive participation next week because essentially you're all under threat and Jonathan's going to lead you through the, the hedge backwards to, to see if we can uh, talk it out and come up with some, some, some concrete ways forward. So thanks again. Uh, see you next week. Have a safe week. An enjoyable week. Hope the weather stays good, and uh, you never know. We might have a, we might have a new president in the U.S. So until then, goodbye.